Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing Insights. I'm Paul Rickard, filling in for Peter Switzer. Marcus Bogdan, the Chief Investment Officer of Blackmore Capital and the Manager of the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund, is just back from a trip to Europe where he's really been testing the water with a number of European institutions about some of the big themes that are going to dominate market investing. In particular, the transition to green energy, which he thinks is going to have a big impact on our market and in particular, going to shape what happens with Australia's largest resource companies. Marcus joins me later in the program. But first up, let's look at what's happening in the local market. Our lead in today came out of the US because uh, the US quarterly earnings season's kicked off. We had some reasonably strong reports from the banks last Friday, and we saw a bit of follow through action here locally. So I started with, I'm going to start tonight with Adam Dawes from Shore and Partners and just test out what he thinks is the outlook for Australian banks and then explore with them a couple of uh, one of his favourite little small cap stocks that he think is set to grow in the coming days. Here's Adam Dawes from Shore and Partners. Last Friday, the uh, major banks in the US uh, commenced their earnings season. Pretty good reports in the US, and we've seen a bit of a flow through rally uh, on the Australian market today. Can you give me his thoughts in terms of what's happening in the banking sector, plus some other great ideas? I'm joined by Adam Dawes from Shore and Partners. Adam, welcome to the program. Yeah, it's great to be here, Paul. Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, some good results in the US. We saw a good, quite a bit of a rally there on Friday night, a bit of a flow through into our market. Um, how do you think the banks are positioned, given on the one hand we've had this uh, sort of quasi sort of pressure about liquidity crisis, others saying, you know, the best days are behind them because net interest margins aren't going to go any higher? Yeah, look, and, and Commonwealth Bank was certainly in the, the square, uh, in, in the target of that NIM, not being able to go higher, and we certainly saw some charts, and hence why we saw Commonwealth Bank go from $110 down to sort of $92 but mm. seems to be recovering quite nicely at the moment uh, at, at around that sort of $99, $100. I think it opened at $100 today. So, yeah, certainly something that looks looks not too bad. But, yeah, you're right. The, the, the banks have come under a fair bit of pressure on that NIM, and is it going to be as good as it gets? Well, bank valuations, I think, look fairly supportive at these levels. It really does come down to are they defensive or are they expensive? And mm. at the moment, it really sort of seems like that on a global context, they don't look too expensive because a lot of the other banks are obviously uh, are doing uh, quite well, in, especially around the world. But it does look like that defensive nature is, is looking like it's going to continue going forward. Certainly, um, the, the, the negatives for the banks is higher funding costs. That's going to happen uh, on a more regular basis potential uptick in bad debts. And really from a strategy perspective, most of my portfolios um, are a little bit underweight the banks at the moment and happy to be that underweight position. Generally, uh, the market likes to have or, or portfolio likes to have around about 30% in the financials. I'm sitting at around 20%, still having banks in the portfolio, but just being a little bit underweight at the moment. Right. And certainly, uh, I guess the banks might do a little better in a relative sense if the market comes off a bit. But uh look like they could get left behind if the market starts to accelerate upwards. Is that sort of would be your sense? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, you, you look at the banks and you sort of think that uh, overall um, our banks have uh, are doing well uh, compared to sort of global banks, um, but they really haven't done much. If you put in taking Commonwealth Bank out of it, just mm -hmm. ANZ, Westpac and NAB, putting a 10-year chart on it really hasn't done much. It's just sort of just moved sideways. But the defensiveness of the banks, and I think that's the sort of where people sort of miss out on these things. When we do get these big global drawdowns, our banks actually perform quite well because yeah. of the deposits, because of the housing, and because of their loan structure. They've gotten rid of a lot of that risky stuff, the financial planning and all the deals that they used to do. That's all gone now. And it's now just a bank deposit taking those kinds of things and home loans. So they've really cleaned up their act. Uh, and it does seem that on these bigger drawdowns, we don't get hit as hard as the global banks. I want to talk about Macquarie because they're a bit different, but of the four majors, just what do you think is the best value there at the moment? 
Yeah, it's tough with the value, isn't it? I mean, you would say CBA, anything under $100, it's just at $100 at the moment. So I don't think there's value there. I certainly see that, you know, overall, uh, NAB has started to take a little bit more market share off uh, Mm -hmm. some of the other incumbents, especially in the small to medium enterprise, the SME side of things. So I think there's some definitely some there. But look, ANZ is probably the best one that I like in the in the space at the moment. ANZ, NAB, uh, Westpac, and then Commonwealth Bank would be sort of in the in the order of where I'd be buying or putting fresh money into the banks at the moment. Okay, let's talk about Macquarie. Of course, Macquarie is a global investment bank, and uh, you know, huge business in commodities, green energy, uh, and more than half its uh, workforce actually outside Australia. So uh, that's yeah. really is a global bank. It's around about $180. It was over $200 at the start of the year. Um, it still hasn't got back up there. In fact, uh, you know, do you think there's value in Macquarie at the moment? Yeah, definitely. These guys can make money in uh, good markets. They can make money in bad markets. And you hit the nail right on the head. Their commodities business is a fantastic business. Their agribusiness is very, very good. And as well as that green side of things, I think is really where you'll start to see that strong demand and performance coming from something like a Macquarie. They will do very, very well. Certainly bank volumes. Um, we have seen Macquarie starting to move into that more of that mortgage side of things. Mm-hmm. That's actually not doing too bad. And the advertisements that they've got are, are sort of are targeting that older demographic, that sort of, uh, you know, sort of not the younger side of things. And I think that's working really well for Macquarie. So I'm really supportive of Macquarie. I think it's one of the best banks here in Australia because of they are able to make money, rain, hail or shine. They always come out to the market and say, look, we're not going to make as much as we did last year, but then they always then are able then to push that forward and uh, usually beat expectations as well. And I suspect they'll do that this time around also. So happy to be buying Macquarie. It's not a bad trading stock either. If you're happy to do a little bit of trading, it's quite volatile, quite liquid and does move around a couple of dollars in a day. So I've I've been doing a bit of trading and some scalping for clients around Macquarie because it's actually quite good. Yeah, and they're, uh, as you say, they're one of the companies, a bit in the CSL category, they like to, uh, they're usually yeah. pretty conservative in their outlook and they uh, somehow they manage to come on the upside uh, yeah. nine out of 10 occasions. So uh, uh, that, that's one of the positives. Just by playing back though, why haven't they got back to sort of where they were? Is they just a function of sort of, we had that little liquidity crisis, maybe the market's not 100% convinced it's over. Uh, are we still a bit of that around or have we got through that? Yeah, I think I think the, the 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 market's probably not giving credit to Macquarie's growth prospects, mm-hmm. and I think that they they they're quite sort of skeptical that it, that can they do it, and you know, and Macquarie's you know it, it does it does it perfectly. They come like you said, they come out and they say, look, it's not going to be as good. Market does get a little bit concerned, does get a little bit worried, and I think that's probably why that they're 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 not as you know they're not back up to two hundred dollars uh, where they are as well. But I, I I remain really confident on Macquarie's green energy side of things. I think this one is going to be huge for them, uh, and that will continue going forward. So yeah, you look happy to be buying it at at one eighty. Happy to be accumulating it here because we know that this bank is very good at what they do, and it will continue to go high once uh, conditions improve. Yeah. All right, let's uh, get a bit racy. Let's go from one extreme to the other, banking to uranium. Let's talk about Paladin Energy. Now, it's been sort of been a lot of hype about uranium. It hasn't really materialised. Paladin Energy has been sort of, like, looks like it's almost been sort of in a bit of a long-term downtrend. I mean, yeah. just give me a sense of where you see the value. Is there value back in that company or are we still, is there still too much hype in the whole uranium sector? Well, the, yeah, the hype, I think, is warranted at the moment inside of the uranium sector. And you've got to take it back, you know, to 2022. Russia invades Ukraine. Uh, you, you've got to remember that Russia accounts for around about 14% of global uranium production and around about 39% of their enrichment capacity as well. So they are a decent player in that space. So then with the Western world and Europe now having to look at other energy sources, so we weren't, we were very reliant on oil, now mm-hmm. Europe's having to look at other energy sources because they can't get it from Russia, albeit China, India, still buying a truckload of oil from Russia. They've had to change their plans. And certainly that means that uranium is potentially now in one of the box seats to moving forward. And certainly uranium price has performed really strongly over the last sort of 2022, up 18%. And potentially that could keep continuing going higher. Now, the uranium spot price at the moment is around $50. Okay, um, I think it's a ton, no, a pound, $50 a pound. So it's not 
blowing you know it's not it's not skyrocketing to a thousand dollars or whatever so it's it's yeah. still very conservative going forward but paladin is a company that can make uranium at 27 dollars a pound so look anything that's going to happen with something like a paladin is does look like it's going to be okay paladin is looking to be in production on the fourth quarter of 2023 so they will start to be producing and always with everything that you want to be inside a producer, it's going to be tough to put a new uranium mine together yeah. now. And, we and still have the free mines policy, don't we? Or the, I think that policy is still in place, right? It's going to take yeah, a lot for a, yeah. you want to put a Labor government to change that policy, isn't it? Which is going to be difficult for them because they want to win elections. So, you yeah. know, so certainly something like that. So always looking at the producers, always looking at uh, something like that. Now, if if Paladin has a risk of that $27 could be a little bit more expensive, they're still able to make $20 a pound and they should be able to produce a fair bit. So, yeah, I think uh, Paladin is one of those ones. I do like Boss Energy uh, as well. I think BOE is very, very good. Uh, Paladin is very good. Uh, you know, so I'm really comfortable with that uranium space. I do feel that uranium has got a longer tail life or longer, uh, longer to go as far as that. And we know that Sprott Asset Management is in their big uranium fund. They are continuing to buy up uranium to keep that price high. So I think that's a real positive for the sector as well. But look, happy to have Paladin in the portfolio. Uh, it, it is all predicated on whether they can get this mine up and running again. And if they can, at $27 a pound, it looks pretty attractive. Let me put you on the spot about uh, you know some good value growth stocks, because we are getting, I guess, the market's getting a little more comfortable that maybe, maybe interest rates are getting close to a peak or have peaked. We've still perhaps got uh, one move by the uh, US Central Bank and probably another move or two in, in Australia. But uh, what's a, you know, sort of a top sort of little growth stock that you think is good value right now? Yeah, so I've got a little little growth stock called IPD uh, Group. Now, the stock code is IPG. Now, I must put up my hand and I own some of this at $3. The current price is $3.70 at the moment, so I do hold this stock in my portfolio. But really what I like about this one, and this is a growth business or a growth mm -hmm. story, is this is a business where they actually build electronic vehicle chargers. Okay, now electronic vehicle chargers are certainly something that we don't have a lot of, and hence why electronic vehicles haven't really taken off here in Australia is because that you've got to travel four hours to three hours to get to Canberra, or you know ten hours to get to Melbourne from Sydney. Uh, the the tyranny of distance is certainly something that is uh, stopped that electronic vehicle production. But there is uh, from the Electronic Vehicle Council says that they need to estimate that needs to be a 1 million electronic vehicles needed by 2027 to reach our net zero commitments by 2050. Now, yeah. if you go back and say, okay, well, we've got all these electronic vehicles coming on board, but we don't have any charges. This is exactly where IPD comes into the picture. Now, IPD has said that there's around about 5,000 charges around Australia at the moment, but they're going to need 20 times that amount by 2030 to keep up with the electronic vehicle production. So in other words, this needs to be 100,000 charges going out there. Now that's just not for retail, that's for fleet, that's for all these other buses, all of these other electronic vehicles going forward. So with such a short, small amount of electronic vehicle charges that are out there, this is something where IPD is in the box seat to perform. They've actually got revenue coming in the door and they are actually profitable and they paid a dividend in the last six months. So all of that is, is still, there's a lot of value there, but it's still a small cap, only $300 million market cap. Uh, and it's certainly something that I've, I, I like and I've been putting my clients into it as well. So IPG is the stock code. And just their sort of competitive advantage. I mean, this must be a field that there must be other players in that can't be unique to Australia. So of course, how yeah, do they so line up against other participants? Yeah, so well, th there are other participants, but it is like a Tesla as an right. example. But the problem is with the Tesla ones, uh, with the charging stations, Tesla uh, only allows Tesla vehicles yeah. to get charged on their <laughs> charging stations. So, of course, uh, I, I, you know, uh, Tesla's doing what they're supposed to be doing, but this, this group is, is going to be coming out with these electronic vehicle chargers that, that will charge everybody. And we know certainly Volkswagen, Porsche, we know all of these big, uh, big car manufacturers have basically said by 2028, we won't be doing combustion engines anymore. It's going to be all electric. So yeah, the the, the wave is changing, and uh, certainly that competitive advantage is, is that 
uh, they'll, they'll be out, hopefully be out there being the first to produce these things for a wider audience. Well, you gave us the appropriate uh, disclosure that you're an owner, but uh, we like to uh, see that. But uh, that's uh, IPD is the name of the company and the stock code. Just to make life some things a little confusing <laughs> is IPG, which happens a lot in the market, doesn't it? It does. It does. <laughs> Look, thanks, thanks for joining us always in Switzer. Thank you. It's great to be here. That was Adam Dawes from Shaw and Partners. Joining me now is Marcus Bogdan. Marcus is the Chief Investment Officer of Blackmore Capital and the manager of the Switzerland and Dividend Growth Fund. And I want to explore with him some of the big themes that are shaping the investment marketplace as we look forward in 2023 and out and further out. Joining me now is Marcus Bogdan, and he's the Chief Investment Officer from Blackmore Capital. Just back from an overseas trip, we want to explore a couple of the big macro themes that are impacting markets. I suppose the biggest one is the energy transition or the transition to clean energy, but also some big changes potentially around healthcare uh, and commercial property. Marcus, thank us. Thank you for joining me. Very good to see you. I want us to come back to the energy transition. I want to start with healthcare in particular, because I believe uh, you've had a chance to have a close look at uh, what CSL's up, up doing up in Europe, and particularly about understanding a bit more about uh, you know, it's it's taking or it's 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 the the blood plasma it captures and the, and the manufacture of the products. Uh, what did you learn from uh, your, your visit to uh, CSL's headquarters uh, uh, in Europe? Well, CSL has manufacturing facilities uh, around the world, and particularly uh, they've got uh, manufacturing facilities in Germany and and Switzerland, and it's a very large market for them. In essence, uh, CSL has been investing quite heavily through COVID into their manufacturing facilities, uh, and that's really improving the underlying efficiencies of those businesses and improving the yields uh, on the plasma that uh, they they produce uh, in those in those facilities. And so, what it clearly demonstrated was that CSL in terms of plasma and plasma therapies, um, that's therapies taken from, from, uh, from what is the plasma um, taken from donors. Uh, they are absolutely the global leader mm -hmm. in, this, in this area. Uh, and you are now starting to see a very strong recovery in their underlying business. Primarily um, the collection of plasma from donors is now 10% above where it was Pre pre COVID, uh, and with improved with improved yields, uh, improved volumes, uh, you now should start to see a recovery in their operating margins as well. So the net takeout from seeing uh, CSL's operations, uh, spending time with other industry participants, uh, is that CSL remains very well placed to continue to grow and to grow in sort of double digits over the forecast period. Now, CSL, as I understand it, Marcus, in terms of the collection of plasma to actual uh, you know, transmission into a product that's sold, it's about a nine-month lag time, and most of the blood plasma is collected in the, in the US. Do you sort of buy the story that CSL can just keep, it's just a matter of being able to, to collect the blood plasma and then turn it into the product? They can almost have this, uh, whatever they can collect, they can virtually sell. Is, is that sort of a, a, a credible story that, uh, that, that, that you buy? Yes, I do, in the sense that the underlying demand for plasma, um, whilst it was disrupted through, through COVID, uh, we still expect from an industry perspective that the demand will grow between 8 to 10% per annum uh, over, over the foreseeable future. Uh, and there are also other applications used for plasma. Mm -hmm. uh, CSL is uh, very much steeped in, in R&D uh, and they've got one product which is at uh, uh, stage three in ter terms of its FDA appro approval, uh, which is called CSL112, which is primarily um, will be used for, for, for heart failure going forward. Now, if that... Um, if that product is commercialised, the expectation is that that has a very large uh, marketplace to address. Now, they've invested also in uh, uh, through an acquisition of the treatment of uh, chronic kidney disease. Did you have any get any insights in terms of uh, 
how the integration of that business is, is going with CSL and what the, the long-term growth plan is for uh, uh, as far as CSL is concerned? Um, it, it was. We saw um, what is na now named called CSL Vi4, uh, mm -hmm. which really looks at sort of iron deficiencies uh, and also diseases re relating to, to kidneys. Um, and what uh, CSL is, is doing is sort of opening up different marketplaces for that, that business uh, and benefiting from the distribution that CSL has, has globally uh, in terms of iron deficiencies. And iron deficiencies uh, is, is an acute issue which affects uh, a very large market. Uh, and I think that the VI4 business uh, should do very well under, under the stewardship of CSL. And it's probably worth pointing out that CSL really only makes one large acquisition uh, every every decade or so. Mm. Uh, previously, they acquired the flu business, uh, which is Sequiris, uh, which is which was turned around very very effectively in recent years. And Viafor um, was uh, acquired last August. Uh, and whilst it is early days here, the integration is going uh, uh, in line with with expectations, uh, and the addressable market remains large. Now, from a shareholder's point of view, we've seen the share price of CSL really sort of, I guess, struggled at that $300 with about $302 a day. It's sort of bubbling either side, hasn't been able to convincingly break through. Uh, did you come back thinking that uh, now's the time to buy a CSL and we could see it really get away from, go through $300 convincingly over the next uh, six to 12 months? Well, we are already holders in, in C CSL and the trip really confirmed uh, the strategic position that CSL has globally, particularly in plasma and particularly mm -hmm. in, in vaccines. Uh, and that thesis uh, was confirmed. And so uh, we do see, even if we're going into slower economic times, uh, that that recovery in healthcare, particularly in CSL, is very much in place. Uh, and so that's an area that we want to be continue to be invested in. Let's move on to the uh, clean energy transition. And that's probably an area where I guess Europe uh, is leading the, the, the globe, certainly leading Australia. What are the sort of implications for that for some of our big you know, carbon emitting resource companies? I think it's worthwhile pointing out that whilst Europe has been the glo global leader in energy transition, uh, the new legislation in the US, the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, equates to around uh, $300 billion in funding over the next several years, mm -hmm. is absolutely significant and is a game changer in terms of how clean energy is supported and funded. Uh, and the expectation is that there's a further uh, $700 billion in private investment, which will be incentivized by the range of subsidies that, 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 that they have had. So the legislation backdrop, particularly in these very large jurisdictions of both the US and Europe, is absolutely significant. Uh, and Australia, uh, because of our resource-rich na nature um, of, our, uh, of our economy, is well-placed to benefit from that. It's well placed to benefit from the uh, the decarbonisation or the potential of the green metals that uh, that that we we can produce. You know, primarily copper, nickel, cobalt, lithium, uh, but also those new projects require significant amounts of steel, and uh, mm. and obviously iron ore is is a significant part in the manufacturing of of, of steel. So. We do see it is one of the, the largest themes uh, backed by significant legislation over, over, over the last year or so. Uh, and through our miners in particular, Australia is well, um, well represented, but also in companies like Macquarie, um, which is leading the world in terms of um, investment in green infrastructure, mm -hmm. green finance, uh, development of new of new projects, and also helping incumbent energy and oil companies such as BP, Shell, and Total 
decarbonize their own footprint, but also move into these new areas of decarbonization. So from an investor's perspective, um, whilst these things will take time to, to evolve, um, I do think it's a, it's a very exciting area to be invested in over the next several years. So how have, uh, if you don't mind, don't mind sharing with us, how have you adjust, been adjusting your portfolio um, over the last sort of 12 to 18 months, I guess, to take account of what obviously is a, is a huge mega trend mm -hmm. um, and yes. uh, something that's going to have a big impact on, on lots of companies over time? Yeah, well, it's it's still very much in in motion, but um, we've had very large positions from a portfolio perspective in companies like B BHP, um, Oz, Oz Minerals on on the on the metals and the iron ore perspective, um, exposures in the oil and gas producers, uh, Santos and Woodside because the fossil fuels, particularly oil and gas, are very important components uh, of, this, of this transition. And they're also moving into new areas um, of, um, of, new, of new energy, particularly car carbon capture and biofuels. Uh, and then finally, through our investment in Macquarie. Uh, but it's a work in progress, and we're looking, looking at other additional names that can capture uh, this this area of investment in in the next several months. Are, are there parts of that market or, or companies that you're just steering away from? Um, we have steered away from the the lithium miners. Uh, we we are far far more encouraged with what we're seeing in in the in the metals uh, such as copper and nickel. Just given given the fact that. Uh, uh, there's a dearth of, of new supply coming on to match the underlying demand. Uh, lithium uh, has had quite significant investment there, and you've seen, uh, you know, compression there in the, in those prices. So it would be in those type those types of of metals, uh, and then also exposure to iron ore, uh, because most of these projects will require significant amounts of steel. Right. Okay. Um, and then moving on to things like commercial property, um, you know, obviously there's a, I guess, a debate going on here, as I sense there might be in Europe in terms of is the sort of the, 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 the work from home type idea, is that going to become permanent? And what does that mean ultimately for the demand for commercial office space and how does that factor into rents and, and at the end of the day, capitalisation rates? We've seen a big... Mm -hmm. Somewhat rather surprisingly late, in my opinion, fall in the value of, of listed property trusts. It took a long time for the market to sort of worry about it, but it's happened. Yes. They've been yes. the worst performing part of the market now for the last sort of six or nine months, I guess. How do you see that playing out? I mean, there's, there are already discounts out there. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we sort of, is, is commercial property, from your point of view, starting to become more attractive as an investor? Not yet. Um, it was very clear that the greatest concern that we saw both in the UK and Europe uh, was um, very much centred on what was happening in commercial prop property. Um, uh, each of the meetings, we probably would have had over 30 meetings. Uh, we did ask the, uh, the participants whether they were going to be returning to the office for five days, and it was an absolute resolute no. And so that does look like a structural shift where people will be working three to two days a week in the office. And now that has a long tail because leases have to roll off. Mm. Uh, and the other issue is that the interest expense has certainly gone up uh, and that will, and as hedges roll off, that expense will also increase. So we do think that there remain significant headwinds in that in that area. At some point, you know, there'll be um, sufficient valuation support there. But just looking at the level level of of gearing, the roll off of leases and the roll off as hedges uh, suggests that you still need to be cautious in that particular area. And the other area that we looked at was industrial properties, um, which had, had done incredibly well uh, through COVID. Uh, you know, the demand there for, for, for warehousing, uh, for the consumer to buy things online, drove a significant demand there, 99% occupancy of, of those industrial warehouses uh, and very, very strong uh, rental growth. Now, those occupancy levels are still incredibly high, 
uh, but we are now starting to see some tapering and uh, on terms of the rental growth going forward as well. So possibly on the industrial side, you know, those best days are now behind us. It's in a much better position than office or retail. Uh, but again, uh, across the spectrum, uh, we are seeing more difficult markets. And finally, Mike, if I can ask you, what was sort of the biggest surprise to you in terms of uh, what you learned there in the UK and, and, and Europe? Oh, most definitely the quantum of the transition, the energy transition, uh, and why we still want to be very much invested in uh, the traditional oil and gas producers, but just given the fact that there's such limited supply coming on. Uh, and the amount of government support is absolutely significant globally uh, for this transition. And so we, we definitely want to be exposed to those new areas of, uh, of, of green metals as, as well. Well, Marcus Bogdan, the, the Chief Investment Officer of Blackmore Capital and the Manager of the Switzerland Dividend Growth Fund, uh, thanks for joining us. That's some really great, terrific insights. Terrific. Thank you very much, Paul. Cheers. Thanks, Marcus, for those insights, particularly around what it means for Australia's major resource companies. Now, don't forget to join me and Peter on Thursday for Boom, Doom and Zoom. That's 12 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we'll be back then. And until next week, thanks for joining us on Switzer TV. Good night.